But look, finally, the, uh, the, the final conclusion is the following. If the first invariant, if the first invariant informs about the distance of this octahedral plan, plane to the origin, so sigma octahedral can be identified or this distance as I1 divided by square root of 3. So if I have a stress tensor and I know the first invariant, the first prime invariant, yeah, invariant A1, I am able to identify what is the octahedral plane of this stress state. Okay? Because I'm able, if I know I1, I can compute that distance and then I can trace this plane. Okay. Now, if I know J prime 2, I am able to compute tau octahedral, so that distance. So now I'm able to identify not only the octahedral plane, but also in the octahedral plane, which is the circle of radius defined by J prime 2, at which the stress state is, 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 is remains. And then, what can we say? What is the third invariant J prime 3 saying? Well, what point of this circle are we telling about? So, in other words, we can say that the first invariant I1, invariant one, defines the position of the octahedral plane. Second invariant J prime two defines the position in a circle around in the on the on the on the octahedral plane. And of course, by elimination, just J prime three. The, th the third inv invariant determines the angle with a certain position, the reference position, the angle that determines the final position. In other words, as we know, we can identify this point either by sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3, but alternatively in a unique form as I1, in terms of I1, J prime 2, and J prime 3. Okay? By the way, this angle here is called the Lode Lode. L O D E angle. Well, and finally, to end this part, don't forget that all what I've said so far, as we assuming that we have this convention of the stresses. Okay, sigma one is greater than sigma two is greater than sigma three. Okay, to make it easier, imagine that you are observing as this guy in a point of the of the hydrostatic uh, stress axis. And you can observe, uh, you, 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 you see that, right? And you see here the x sigma 1, the x sigma 2, the x is sigma 2, and the x is sigma 3, right? And then you see, you would see six sectors, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 sectors, which are divided from this perspective by uh, observed by this observer here. Why I'm saying that? Because this sector, corresponds exclusi exclusively to values sigma 1 greater than sigma 2 greater than sigma 3. This sector, for instance, would correspond as taking sigma 2 as the first principle, as the larger principal stress, sigma 1 as the intermediate, and sigma 3 as the smaller. Another criterion. Okay? So, if I take this criterion, I mean that all points I would see all, all, all what I'm talking about, all the representative points of the stress states are always in that sector. We'll see that we'll define surfaces, surfaces which will be failure surfaces in the, straight, in the stress space when we talk about plasticity. I am anticipating something. But in general, we see that the elastic behavior occurs whenever we are inside some surfaces, inside some surfaces. And as we just, the stress state is on that surface, then plasticity begins. Okay? So in that sense, what I mean is that we will determine that surface for the first octant, and then if we want to generalize this space to all other octants, I have to just use symmetries, so symmetry to construct that, symmetry to construct that, symmetry to construct that, and then we'll obtain something that is general, disregard what is the order of the stresses. Okay? That's a point you have to keep in mind. What we do is just so far, or in, 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 in this lecture, we consider that criterion will obtain some figures, and then in order to generalize that to all other possible 
ordering criteria of the principal stresses, we know the gain, the way to do that, which is just symmetrizing with respect to the other uh, uh, planes.